Yeah. Pull up mic in a bit closer. You're moving about, aren't you? Well, not. You just, are. I'm, you're I'm like, just, I'm, when I look away, I'm existing. When I look away, you're going like this. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just about you moving. I'm sort of breathing and stuff. I'm kind of, you know. I've never been if I'm looking around. It's kind of, you know. <laughs> Just Dom Nichols, absolute pleasure to have you in the studio, mate. Absolute pleasure. Glad we could make it work. Yeah, no, thanks Thanks for having me along. I'm sorry I keep moving. <laughs> if it gets quiet, it's when I'm looking around. So many gizzits in here. It's like, just, you know, I'm trying to <laughs> stay out of the corner of my eye. It's all sorts of st- there's all sorts of cool stuff in here. There is. I'm very lucky. Very, very, well, very, very lucky for the stuff that came free. So see this shelf? Yeah. A guest brought that. He turned up with a shelf and brackets. Right. And the light. It's a uh, guy... Um, Oh no, I've forgotten his name. Oh, God. That serves you right, because oh, 20 no, seconds no, no. in, you're having to go at me for not bringing you a Prezi. Yeah. No, no, no. At least no, you can do no. it forget not... his name. <laughs> Moth Creature is the company. Why have I... Oh, Gaz, Gaz Allen, yeah. Gaz Allen, sorry, Gaz, I forgot your name there. Moth Creature, turned up with a... Sh- I mean, he's the kind of person as well you would expect to turn up with a, a crazy... Oh, I mean, who turns up to, for an interview with a shelf? However, it is an exquisite shelf. Made it himself. The bullet lamp on the far right, he made himself. Um... The brackets he made himself. It's just, it's cool. Yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about, we're not going to talk about Gaz Allen and Moth I'm Creature. Not about, I'm not talking we're about We're going to talk about Dom Nichols. What are we going to talk about, Dom? Well, I want to ask you. <laughs> what's it job. like, uh, what's it like, uh, what's more difficult? Engaging with senior ranks when you're serving or senior ranks when you're a journalist what's more challenging more challenging um more challenging i suppose i don't know maybe i'd say more challenging when you're serving because i found that's not because that bar's gone higher i'd say it's easier for me now so one of the reasons i left i guess is because i always wanted to be able to turn around to the senior echelons of the military and I mean I didn't rub along with politicians at the time but I you know there were times when I wanted to turn around and go well, why or, or how the hell did you come to that conclusion that that was a good idea or whatever and, and just I necessarily didn't in the military because I, I either wasn't at that level or you know it's a hierarchical that's what it is the military is a hierarchical organization so you just sort of don't turn around and go hang on um, I think it's bollocks anyone else with me on that one so now I can do all that, and I and I do maybe without this sort of you know that's bollocks, <laughs> minister. But it, so it's easy now to to hold to ask the questions that I always wanted to ask. I suppose that's what I'm saying. Do you think that the do you think that the military headshed? I mean, at the very top, do you think they are able to strike the right balance between the the political influence, uh, the the societal needs if you like or the needs of the country and the the needs and capability of the forces themselves are are they able to um i mean it's i think i think they are able to do they allow themselves to um sometimes no i mean look the military Take the army, okay? I was, I was in the army. Um, go anywhere, covered in oil paintings. Every room you move in, there's, you know, generally dead Frenchmen lying about the place and, you know, cover, all the rest of it. Good stuff. So, but that history and all those traditions and the values and the ethos and all the rest of it, that, that could be gone in a year. Every single person in the military could do seven clicks to freedom this morning. And in a year's time, you haven't got anything. So all those hundreds of years of tradition could, could count for nothing if everyone decided, nah, it's not for me anymore, the deal ain't worth it, I've got a better offer outside, or you're just not playing fair by me and my values and my family, so, I, so I'm off. So the military leadership have to be really, really careful, small c conservative in their changes. The super tanker has to turn slowly. Um, so I, I get why sometimes it's pretty obvious that stuff needs to happen. But they can't. They can't do it in one in one fell swoop because too much change, and and you tip too many people overboard. And you might I remember the um, so the voluntary redundancies. I remember the the last round of voluntary redundancies in twenty thirteen fourteen ish. The the problem with those kind of things, uh, saying voluntary redundancy, is that is that too many people are then exposed to their 
God, this sounds terrible. Too many people exposed to their value outside. Yeah, you know, they'd never thought about going and working for a, a mining company or a logistics firm or driving or, or what have you. And suddenly they are faced with, oh, I could get this on voluntary redundancy. Well, what are you going to do with that? Well, I could, I could, I could go and do that. And suddenly they get a view of what of what they are. Firstly, worth in, in monetary terms, and they think, well, hang on, why am I being paid that then in the in the military? And they start thinking about that'd be easy for the family. I could live there, and that's a nice that's a nice lifestyle. I could do that. And then they don't get the voluntary redundancy because only what it was two thirds of the applicants got it. You then have another third of people who, who you've already seed the sorry, so the the seed of another life. And I know people who didn't get voluntary redundancy but said, sorry, I'm off anyway. I've already thought about another life. I can make the numbers work. I've had a couple of interesting um, interesting chats. I'm I'm off. So back to the question about senior leadership. They if they if they tip the boat too too violently in terms of a new direction and you lose loads of people over the side because they've got other because they're you know, still young, young, bright, all the rest of it, you know, you could you could be worse off. So I can see why they t they take big decisions very slowly or after much, much thought when we're all going, come on, it's obvious. We were talking about this years ago. Why haven't you done it yet? I can see why why they, they sometimes won't allow their their inner, inner desire for, for action and, and leadership and all that kind of stuff to, to come through. On the subject of voluntary redundancy, a little birdie tells me, and I'm very conscious of the conversation we're just having about news being published on He Said, She Said. However, a little birdie tells me, very reliable source, that um, it may, you know, this may have been made public. I don't know that one of the so one of the impacts of that COVID has had on the military is they haven't cut the numbers as quickly as they needed to. In fact, that yeah, you know, basically, so the reten the retention went up during COVID. People weren't leaving as fast. So where they were trying to reduce the numbers, now they're, they're way behind the curve. They need to they need to shed quickly. And now, in fact, the reports just come out about yeah the, the restructure may hmm. say I'm talking rubbish. But one of the things that's coming is they are going to uh, so anyone who is non-deployable, so for whatever reason, whatever level, but non-deployable. So per, let me phrase that: permanent non-deployable. For example, people who are amputees or other stuff, deaf, you know, partial deafness, tinnitus, whatever. Uh, they are going to terminate the contracts. They're not going to offer redundancy. They're going to terminate the contract. Service no longer needed. Goodbye. They may. They're talking about um, that people within a year or two years of either their full 22, 23, 24, either their, their end of service where they get the full pension or their half pension to 12 years, they may offer them. Uh, they may offer them that pack that that pension. Like at the two years before year before point, but yeah, terminate contracts. Goodbye, not needed. No redundancy package. Have you heard anything about that? I've not heard that. Um, I would be surprised that I mean, well, that's completely incoherent with all the other messaging the military is putting out about how we need to use more reserves. We need more people in cyber. Um, the, the, you know, Nick Carter. CDS was was uh, has talked regularly about you know, fitness standards will be uh, will be changed for those those people who don't need to be, you know, um, in the kind of high high end infantry mould. So if and I hesitate because you know it wouldn't be the first time I've seen the military absolutely shoot itself in the foot or mi miss shooting itself in the foot. Um, but there's there's a great opportunity if if they if they want to do that if they want to reduce numbers there's a there's a golden opportunity to say re-roll reservist X or this that and the other um, so I'd be su I'd be surprised but but not not completely surprised this idea this idea of what's deployable is interesting when you know when we've now got Reaper crews up at Waddington so they are they are earning medals now for operations. Um, and I used to have a Reaper driver work for me, so I know there's huge psychological pressure these, these men and women are under. The drones? Um, the drones, yeah. Um, so I'm not saying it's it's easy, because it's not. And the and, and chap I'm talking about, mate, mate of mine, he, uh, you know, the, cl the classic military thing, he was, on, he was on a mission, and then two hours later he was in Morrison's and had a meltdown because his kids were shouting about the flavour of ice cream. It was, it was straight out of central casting type thing, you know, I don't mean to make light of it, but you know, there, there's there's great psychological pressure on these on these people. But, you know, so the, the concept of what is deployable 
So the concept of, of when you are in danger, we can talk about what does that mean that RF Waddington is then a target for Russian hypersonic missiles? Yes, no. Are we, you know, w w where's, where's warfare going? That's probably a conversation for another day. But, you know, the idea of what is deployable and then the value of an individual. So, ah, you mentioned amputees. So, you know, you're no longer deployable. I, I don't know, but can you be a Reaper driver if you are double amputee? I genuinely don't know. But, but I, I get... There needs to be more thought on what what does this term deploy will mean? Does it does it actually mean anything anymore if we're moving more into the cognitive domain and, and AI and online systems and blah blah blah? What 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 how much does it matter anymore if you if you can't do press ups? Uh it, well no, I agree, but it, you it just does. Power, you're ex power rage, you can you know. <laughs> it it matters where you're talking about someone who's non deployable who who was once deployable and they're in the military and to go and take up another occupation within the military re roll so to speak requires an injection of funding to train them and resource to train them um why do that when you can just fulfill those reaper driver roles from people who who are jo joining up to do it for example the other one is as you get smaller as a force you or the, the, yeah, the smaller for, the force you are, I think, the more attention you need to pay to how the, to the quality of that force, how high quality is. It's, it's one of the reasons I think the, the, the British forces, HM forces, are the best in the world. Among the best in the world, certainly, right? if not the best in the world. Because we've got no choice. Because we're so small. We're a small nation. We, we're not large. In, we're not large compared to other, other you know, uh, other uh, mili other militaries, America, China, Russia, you name it, not mm. wherever. We're not large, and but but we, you know, we, we are we are a target, right? And we are perceived as a threat, and so we have to pay strong attention to how good we are. So, which is why we have, which is, and we've got a smaller pool to recruit from, you know. So we have to pay more attention to how quality our troops are. Yeah, no, I, I, I can. I waffled agree on a bit. I waffled on a bit there, but I think I made a point somewhere along the line. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I'll, I'll drag through the ashes and see what we can find. Um, no, but it's interesting. So is, is that what the what the British military can do now? Are we a convening power? I.e., we can kind of set the benchmark and say this is this is a kind of you know seen to be the best of 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 what uh, airborne action is. This is the best mine hunting. This is this is how you do. Um, uh, amphibious assaults or what have you we we can't do it at any great scale but we are content that we've put the intellectual horsepower and the the money into r d and technology to this is we think this is best of breed and then export that and be known to be a military that you can trust so what what right have we got to go and train the nigerians how to shoot straight and then hopefully hopefully you use them in the widest sense of the world to to combat Boko Haram and the and the, the migrant flows up through Northwest Africa. Well, we you know we don't have any God given right, but if we're seen as the as the um, as the exemplar of these standards, then that's that's not a bad thing. Even if someone can go, well, you know, you you haven't got many people, that's a, that might that might not be that might not be a a, a red line. Um, now, whether or not that's that's doing the right thing, if you look at what China is doing with its Belt and Road Initiative and 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 sort of funding foreign policy through um, yeah, we're trying to exert influence through these small bands of determined men and women and the DA network you know, going out and doing all this stuff. That's the, you know, where the Ranger Regiment ideas come from. Um, China are doing it slightly differently by uh, weaponizing, my word, you know, their, like I say, Belt and Road. So look at what happened two days ago with in Entebbe in, in Airport in Uganda. Uganda defaults on a, on a loan. China say, there you go, there's a load of cheap money to, for you to go and uh, build uh, Entebbe Airport, the international airport in Uganda, in Kampala. And um, where the Entebbe raid was, uh, that one, and um, they defaulted on the loan. So China says, right, we're having the airport. So China's now got these little ink spots around the world of real estate, doing the same in in Pakistan. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's kind of what we what we used to do, what we're trying to do with the overseas development aid and initiative. That's you know, there's different ways of exerting your your power and your values overseas. We're trying to do it through, as I said, through you know, STT, small small term training teams and, and so on and so forth up to the concept of the ranger ranger regiment um, but it's all about exerting your influence overseas and and do you need to have a massive army massive standing army military to do that or if you are known to be very good albeit very small that might be that might be the right answer we're getting close to having to 
having to choose. I mean, I'm not quite going to miss it. It's either Lenin or Stalin, some some famous Russian. I don't know. Who said, you know, there's um, the quantity has a quality all of its own, and there there is something in that. And equally, the the, the the converse of that is the same. That you know, once you get too small, you can't keep banging the drum saying, "Yeah, but we're the best. We are really the best. We're the best." Like you're tiny. You're absolutely tiny. Can you put a heavy metal warfighting division in the field today? Yes, we can. The kit's really old, and you know, probably can't supply it for more than three or four days. And you know, the ammunition stocks for the MLRS will run out at sort of tea time. But you know, so are you credible? What 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 does it take to be credible these days? And I wonder. I just worry that we are on the on the cusp of of no longer being credible. Come on, great, yeah, Ranger Ranger Regiment, Wee. brilliant. Why is it a worry? Because. Um, once you're no longer credible, then the other side starts to look, look very attractive. By the other side, I mean in terms of values and what you what you believe in. Um, the, the coin, the, I was told that the so the game is for Western forces, NATO forces, you've got to be taken seriously by the Americans. And to do that, the Army would have to put heavy metal division into the field. Navy would need a carrier strike group. Air Force need an expeditionary air wing. Now, we kind of got the last two. And maybe warfare is moving differently and you don't need to have all this all this stuff around. It is a very old mentality. I get that to say, oh, just you know, stop with all this cyber stuff, just give me tanks. But there's a, there is a certain element, there's a certain sort of simplicity to that. Just to say, look, let's, let's just do that and do it really well. So I just worry that we are, that we are um, becoming too specialized in in areas that, that, when it comes to it, don't don't carry the day. So last week the army announced its um, future soldier, uh, the the transformation program, you know, re-rolling units and new cap badges and, and all the rest of it. And they say that we're going to be investing in the deep, the deep battle, um, long range fires, long range artillery, hypersonic stuff, space based, you know, command and control, blah blah, blah great, good stuff. But the flip side of that is that you are, and I asked this, the flip side of that is that you are then Basically, turning around to your allies and say, "Right, lads, we're going to do the we're going to do the deep. Um, you 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 can do the close, the kind of the you know the nasty stuff. The well, it's all nasty, but you know the the here and now, the the um, you know, know yeah, the last six inches of defence policy made of steel, as I was told once. I said, "What do you mean, a small tank? No, no, bear Um So yeah, and that that is not a good look. If that if that view is taken by our allies, by the Americans, if that's if that's a message they take from our transformation programs, like, oh, you guys are getting out of the close game then, are you? You're taking a capability gap for 10 or 15 years until you sort yourself out with Charlie 3 and Ajax and, and you know, ground-based air defense and where are we going with all this kind of stuff? If you know, if we're not there for 10 years, is that is that okay? If we're sort of cheerily, if we're driving forward on the technology side and the cyber and being integrated across government and with our allies and using our using our DA network to which is going to be expanded by a third, we're told, to to look for business and and recce pull. They're going to pull forward the the range regiment to go and do all this stuff. That might be that might be terrific. But if if the Americans turn around and say, guys, you, you know, you're not you're no longer a serious credible warfighting body, then that that is very concerning. The, the head of trade. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm not waffling. Last last point, the head of trade or training doctrine command. Some years ago, U.S. guy said, uh, you know, heard a lot about, um, you know, virtual this and, and AI and blah, blah, blah. And he said, virtual presence is actual absence. Well, that kind of says a lot, I think. Which, I'm not, I wasn't trying to interrupt you. I, when you were saying DA network, are you, are you Sorry. defense attache? Okay, yeah. just checking. All right, okay, cool. Because um, some people might not know what you're waffling on about. Sorry. Not waffling. waffling. Some oh, people know, know, might not know. <laughs> No, I'm not going to mention the shelf again. Uh, what was that? What were you talking about then? I want you to carry on. What were you talking about? You were. Uh, what was the uh, so, virtual virtual presence is actual absence? Explain that to me. So this was a, this was a criticism of. Um, I, I, well, I think it was a it was a, a warm sort of friendly criticism from the US towards the British that yeah. Have, have as many war games as you like in cyberspace, tabletop exercises, that's great. But, you know, when when did we last do? And some of these big, I mean, was it, I mean, I wasn't around then. Exercise Lionheart, I think 1984, when we like, had 10 or 15,000 people in the field in Germany, 
trundling around. I mean, just it was like the big odd. And obviously, we're not going to do that anymore. But when do we last do the the last big big exercises? Batus is not closing, contrary to reports in the Telegraph. But it's going down to it's going down to. Su- I'm told subunit training, light light roll training, the big all arms battle group training with the military, you know, live firing and air power is moving to the Oman. I'm I am told. Um, so when you know, but but if that's what we're doing, so a battle group exercise. When do we last do a brigade exercise? When do we last? Didn't we do? Wasn't there some massive exercise in France in the last couple of years? Huge. I'm sure that was 16 Brigade. I'm sure there was others involved, and it was with the French. I'm sure that was in the last couple of years. Maybe even been last year, you know. Well, no, I mean, there have been some massive exercises, and and so that knits everything together at a at an international level, and I'm not I'm not denying that that is absolutely necessary because you've got to be able to do this. I mean, ARC is, a, you know, by nature of what it is, it's an international body. The Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. So, so you have to be able to do that. But, but what I mean is that you know our our contribution to it, 16 Brigade, yeah, but big force. In terms of the armour and stuff like that, when do, when do we last practice rolling it all out? We do it in cyberspace, and I think the US US were just gently saying, look, just let's not let's not lose the ability. All the the fog of war, the classic. You got all your great great plans, but um, I mean, I remember I used to be in be in tanks. And I remember the, we we got up one morning for a for a battle and the first thing I did was obviously reverse out of my position because yeah, it's clever. I went straight through a chicken shed, you know, and I had barbed wire wrapped around my axle within the first ten seconds of the battle start. I couldn't move. You, know, you just can't do that on in cyberspace. Um or maybe you can. Maybe someone should think of a chicken shed barbed wire inject for uh, for these war games. But yeah, the reality of, of trundling around in, in the field is um is experience that you just can't replicate to the to the extent that I think you need to if you do everything virtually do you think that we are when i say we i mean western powers west america uk everywhere else um or in fact people who are potentially the enemy of china or russia should we say do you think that we are not playing as clever a game as what they are in and i'm what i mean is they seem to be super focused on destabilizing so destabilizing um societal unrest certainly the russians okay i'm talking about like influence of well, their, their, their site their bot their bot their bot network their influence on well us you know, us elections an example uh divide societal divide polarization same here in the uk China is doing sort of the same thing, just not. It's just not as obvious, and also on their focus on grabbing hold of resources and focusing on that, as opposed and, and worrying less about the the, the future military in, uh, engagements, future military conflict. Um, do you think that's a concern? Or not because the thing is with China, this is what worries me, right? About Russia and China, they have they have the ability to to play a much cleverer, longer game because they don't have to worry. the The leaders, the people at the top, are not worried about not being at the top in two, three, four, five years' time. They can plan a generation ahead because they know they're going to be there in a generation's time. They can play the long game. They can be much less connected. They can have to. They can. They can play chess as opposed to play flipping drafts, your know, checkers, whatever you want to call it. That that's is a real concern of mine, which is, um, I think we've seen that with the way China, the China has moved the last twenty years. You know, it's just it's a, it is not the beast. It, the beast it is now was not what it was twenty years ago. You know, um, yeah. That's the limit of my knowledge on that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the, I'm going to ask you now, Lieutenant. Do, do you see what I'm? Do you, is that? Yeah, I, I think we. I just feel like we're behind the times. I just feel like we're behind the times, and it's going to come and bite us in the ass. I think they are. They are subtly different. Um, so China is very interesting. China. Um, I just don't think we see the world similarly. And we're thinking, why are they? Why are they kind of, you know the drum about Taiwan can't they see that would be a red line for us and they're they're the other the completely other way around they're, they're thinking well why why are they going on about these you know 
our part of our our homeland. So I think that I think that miscalculation or the misunderstanding could be could be very dangerous. <coughs> China's always had this. Oh, oh yeah, okay, here we go. Cod psychology from Dom. Um, the the rise of the middle class in China has, has, has all been built on this idea of look. We're in charge. You're going to have to surrender some of your human rights and some of your kind of, you know, free thinking. But you'll be prosperous, and your children will be more prosperous than you. That's the deal. Okay, everyone in? Yep, happy. Great. Let's go. So that that has kind of fueled this rise, but it it almost can't go on forever. The world is too connected. Even though there's great, the Great Firewall of China, ideas spread, and and I just wonder for how much longer this idea of um of not being able to, to, to live the life they want will um, will endure in China. And, and, and at what point the party, CCP, Communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, are, are just allowed to say, look, this is the deal, you know, you've got to take it, there's no leaving it. I, I don't know, I mean, Xi Jinping, President Xi, is, is, is an absolute, um, absolute ruler, and one of the with Deng Xiaoping and oh the other guy whose name escapes me, you know he's one of the th the three the three great modern Chinese leaders. So he's he's come he's kind of beyond approach, but I just wonder the cohort around him. So who's 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 giving him advice? Who's who's able to turn around and speak truth to power? There's almost nobody there now, and that's that's very dangerous. And he's been very clear. He made these comments last week about Taiwan, saying that it's it's not for negotiation. You know, we, we're going to be reunified with Taiwan. That, that's it. Now they're playing. He's playing a very, a very canny game because he's he's got no room for manoeuvre now. That is it. So the U.S. led sort of opposition to that idea. You know, is it, is it back to the winning the fight without without fighting? And do, do we kind of go, geez, they're, they're serious about this? Is it is it really worth it? Or is there some accommodation? We say, well, hang on, no, the time's moved on. Taiwan is is, is they want to be. Independent, and if you try to take it by by military means, that would just be an absolute mess. And even if you do it subtly through through coercion, intimidation, you know, political intimidation, um, and then you know, there is some sort of soft reunification. Now, what does that mean for the world um, and for U.S. credibility and for the uh, world semiconductor market, which is dominated by Taiwan? So, so China is is extremely tricky. Um, they haven't got a huge amount of friends, so the recent AUKUS deal, the Australia, sorry, the yeah, Australia UK US deal over submarines that upset the French. Um, China got very, very heated about that. When actually, when you think about it, I mean, nothing's going to happen for ten or fifteen years. There's not going to be any sort of steel sausages floating around the South China Sea for a long time yet, if there ever will be. Did you say steel sausages? Submarines. I, I, I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for thank you for explaining that. that. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. I've just never heard I've never heard that before. <laughs> so you know, so they they get very upset by that, and so that's interesting. This massive behemoth, this power, is really really undermined by these alliances that are, that are the kind of this coalition of the willing. If you got to know, no, don't don't use that phrase. But these these, these like minded countries with with similar values. Russia's slightly different. Russia <laughs> Russia. Um, wants to be seen as great power. Russia is great power, historically. Um, tiny GDP, aging population. It's got a massive problem coming down the tracks. Um, Putin's next up for election. Ha! Huh. Election in inverted commas, twenty twenty six, I think. But you know, what comes? What comes next? Um, they've actually. I mean, the whole Nord Stream two. I'm just warning you. Someone's going to walk in you a minute and go, "You're right." I'm going to be recording. <laughs> it's going to be your mate Charlie, I reckon. That was him shouting. You know, you probably couldn't hear it through the microphones. Sorry for interrupting. If the door bursts open, I'll say hello and I'll dismiss him. Um, go on. Uh, oh, what's the big problem that they got rolling down the tracks? What is it? Well, an, an aging population. Um, so less productive. I mean, the GDP is tiny. I can't think. I'm going to get this completely wrong. But I, you know, I, th I think they might be on a par with Italy. I'm, going, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to Italy. Haven't listening. we all got this issue though of an aging population? We've all got the issue. We're all living. Like Not. That. I think they've got. I think they. Their demographic is about to fall off a cliff, and what's coming up behind them? The younger generations are increasingly um, small L, liberally minded. They they don't they don't sort of buy into the idea of the of the autocratic leader. They want their freedoms. You know, Navalny is very popular in opposition opposition leader. Um, I, th I don't think people like the idea of having having dictators back there again. So that that if that's the future, 
you know, if, if there are fewer people and more of them are politically opposed to the party, that, that's a problem for those in, those in power today. Now, whether that makes them retrench or reach out, it's difficult to say. But, I mean, Russia have been very clever with their, their use of energy as part of, um, you know, part of their foreign policy. I don't particularly like the phrase hybrid war because it kind of implies that, that it's something new. <laughs> And it's not really using all this stuff, using energy, using coercion, using um, all the other methods short of the traditional threshold of conflict. I mean, it's not it's not brand new. We used to do it. We do it. Um, so I think that but, but the, the example of of how potentially vulnerable Germany is to to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline um, you know they can't turn, they can't say no now they're too far down. Uh, explain the situation, please. So Russian gas basically heats heats Western Europe. <coughs> that's me. That's not me. That's him. Um, Russian gas heat, heating Western Europe. Um, so as we saw in the in the crisis what, last month, you know they, it's it, it largely at, at the largesse of Moscow. Whether or not we can. So what was the cause last up. month then? Of the gas shortage, remember, right? Uh, the cause. The cause I, was... Sorry for being so ignorant with this. I, I just... Yeah, I am. So I'm led to believe it's a number of factors, largely the world waking up after lockdown, the sudden, sudden demand for, for energy to get the economies going again or businesses opening again. I think that was the biggest contributing factor. And so suddenly we all, need, we all needed more, more power, more fuel, more heat. Um, and, you know, for Russia are... I don't ask me the percentage, I don't know. But if they're a large... Um, supplier of energy to Western Europe, then it's you know it's in their gift <laughs> to whether the lights stay on. I mean, it's just you, that's why you got to diversify your your energy. That's why we, we're we're trying to be a massive green energy um, producer. But partly, so we're not so we're not beholden on another country. I think Germany are, are much more beholden than, than we are. Um, yeah, and Ukraine as well. Because I think the pipeline. Now, where's the pipeline go? I'm on the, right on the edge of my jigsaw now. But I think that's partly why there's the tension, or that's that's a that is why Ukraine is very vulnerable. I'd have to give that a bit more thought. I can't exactly, I can't remember all the details. I'm oh, sorry. I'm no. rambling now. Let's talk about the shelf. No, that's right. When I was working in Iraq, well, after I left, <coughs> working on the oil fields, and uh, when I say working on the oil fields, I was doing security on the oil fields, and I learned that in the Ramal oil field, so you see those iconic images of you know pipe flames pipelines uh, to the layman you look at it and think oh the pipelines are in flames and they're burning off excess gas waste gases right and those waste gases um in in the in the worst instance those wa was those waste gases can't be that they can't be used to anything can't be used to anything there's no use to the man or beast um and so it has to be burnt off in the best case scenario the waste gas you get from drilling oil is it can be pumped theoretically could be pumped directly into a house it is household gas straight off the bat good to go and you could use it in house Ramala oil field produces as a byproduct the best kind of gas it's a byproduct it burns off but they can't they can't pipe it anywhere they don't have the infrastructure to pipe it anywhere for, to use it they burn off in one day enough natural gas, uh, natural gas, enough um, gas to power the whole of Iraq for six months. In Ramal oil field, in one day, they burn it off. Fact. Fact, as I said so. It fact, yes, yeah, the whole of Iraq for six months. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. You you look sceptical. Like I've just pulled this, <laughs> just pulled this out of my ass. <laughs> it, I was told that by one of the, one of the oil guys, uh, one of the oil guys down. Um, I was working for either Schlumberger or Weather for the company, which company it was, but yeah. Well, I think it's just terrifying. I mean, I don't, I've got nothing, no reason to doubt that. But it's just, why, why, why hasn't that problem been fixed? Because <laughs> it's Iraq. Because yeah. it's Iraq. What well, I mean, you know, it's it, some places just always going to be a drama because of where they are, unfortunately, in the world. Yeah. You know? yeah. Iraq being a prime example. It's not exactly. It doesn't exactly lend itself to. Prosperity can't right. grow much there, you know. Um, no, it's a different subject altogether. We have gone right off the beaten path here. Right, Poseidon, 
tell me about Poseidon. I spotted a T-shirt as soon as as soon as we came in the studio. I spotted a T-shirt. I like it. So I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. Bootnecks are behind it. Because I'm assuming you wouldn't wear that. So wear something that's not. You would choose to wear something that's veteran owned coming on this podcast for whatever reason. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two is water. Bootnecks like water. Um, Am I wrong? Am I completely no, no, wrong? No, no, you're, you're, no. You're, you're on the right lines. I mean, I, I, I grabbed it as I was running out this morning, you know, getting dressed. Um, it, it was beneficially one of the t shirts I have. That was connected to the veterans, and I thought, ah, oh, right, that's great. I love that because I want to, you know, help these guys if I can. You, you still haven't worked out the first bit, though. Poor. Yeah. Anyway, these guys, booties, ex booties. Hang on, what um, am I missing? What am I missing? Down in yeah. pool. What am I missing? Why are you taking advantage of me? Like all this? dog handlers, former dog handlers, and they now own and run the business is um, dog hydrotherapy. So I've got a massive swimming pool, and when I went down there, uh, there was Duke. This great Dane, who was the size of Belgium, jumping around in his swimming pool, just having the time of his life. And, but they're all trained. They were they were dog handlers, and they then did all the correct courses to be um, dog physios. Forgive me, the dog physio fraternity. I've got the terminology all wrong. But they're they're not vets, but they are oh. physios for dogs, and they use water. They, they've got a treadmill in this in this great pool. And um, and so it's amazing. It's a lovely. So I went. I, I heard about this. Went down. Had chat. It's like Telegraph sweet spot. It's dogs, <laughs> and, and it's veterans. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, ha- ha- happy days. Great, great story. And chatting to them, I'd say all, all dog handlers. And there was, um, they did have a Malinois there. One of the one of the guys, a, a Belgian Malinois breed, a dog. You know, super intelligent, lovely, loyal, just really bright, um, great dog. And some of the guys had. Are they the attack dogs? I, I think they can be trained in in restraint and all the rest of it, which. Yeah. Um, <coughs> God God not Sorry, me. still not me. Um, so, but these guys all got So some some of these guys had 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 lost their dogs in combat, um, and uh, some of them had lost their dogs when they they themselves the 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 booties had been had been you know injured shot on on ops, so. It rapidly. I went down there, kind of ha ha. Dogs, water, veterans. What was not to like? Telegraph, bish bash bash, and rapidly found actually the, the the real story was how much therapy are these guys giving to the dogs, and how much therapy are they getting from working with animals, being together, you know, working through injury. It's an injured animal and an injured man. They were all men, three or four of them, um, and I just thought, wow, that's amazing. And just, just so I spent a day day with them. And what started off, like I say, it's, I mean, it was all lighthearted. It was lovely. They're great, great guys running this business. Um, and uh, but yeah, we 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 suddenly got into uh, some, some pretty deep conversations about about looking out for each other and looking after yourself and being being wounded physically, mentally, and how the dogs and animals and being around them can help with that. And I think, you know, maybe my background allowed them to feel it was safe to talk about some issues they might not have talked about with other reporters, I don't know, but it was a just an amazing, amazing place. Did um, you do a story on them? I did do a story, yeah, this was a couple of years ago. I, but yeah, I just Google Telegraph, put, um, poor side, I, don't, I would have mentioned poor side, but Duke, Duke the Great Dane. Um, yeah, and it was, it was very clear, it was, it was, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people helping, helping themselves and the animals were, were giving back. Uh, yeah, it was lovely. Lovely place set up down in one of the one of the trading estates down in Poole. Um, yeah, so Paul Sidon, oh, brilliant genius. I'll have genius. to stop in next time I'm down there. Yeah, I don't get down very often. Nice part of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, that that I thought was it. so in terms of veterans getting out, yeah, you know, using mili- their, what what they learned in military service, taking it taking it elsewhere. I thought that was I thought that was fascinating, and that's um, you know one of the reasons that. Uh, you, you came to my uh, came to my attention. I'm very interested in. Here we go. <laughs> I'm interested in what. Yeah, when what, did I come to your attention? Well, what we do was it last year, I think, and um, we were talking about that. Um, the Chinook. I can't remember. We, we connected on Twitter over the. Uh, oh, I put the picture the, up of the, and the yeah. And women she was getting drivers. grief. Yeah. Um, but that's another, that's another story. But no, I mean, here we are in H hour 
um, towers uh, up on the, I've got a nosebleed going up on the express elevator to the 50th floor here. It's, it's amazing. Um, but no, I'm just very interested in these in these initiatives. These, um, I mean, this this isn't. Don't mean to dig into your finances. But I know this isn't a business. I don't know. But but Port Arden is a business. I'm, but I mean, I mean, these initiatives by by veterans to that that helpfully counter this this narrative of all veterans being mad, bad, sad, old, Second World War, <sighs> injured, damaged. You can't trust them. All the rest of it. Um, and and yeah. So so the so the more I the more I watched you and listened to you, <laughs> the more I, the more I like this this initiative. I think it's I think the messaging. The MOD are terrible at messaging. They they do not. Where's the MOD podcast? Where is the MOD monthly press uh, conference on, for us? Hang on, hang on. Are you telling me? Are you telling me that Soldier Magazine is not sufficient? Are you telling me that is behind the times? Is that? I actually quite like social media. Do you? <laughs> well, it's it's all it's all right. It's okay. It's okay. When you on the subject like MOD podcast, for example, to to what are you? Internal comms or external comms? Do you know what's interesting? That I see that is no, something I've noticed. I don't know what's been going on, but I've noticed over the last yeah, over the last few months really, is the use of Twitter being the main one by serving officers to communicate messages to their units. Yeah, very very strange. Yeah, no, very I, strange. I've yes yeah, seen that, and that's not the kind of part one orders in on Twitter. It's just bonkers. I don't get that, um, and I don't get why. So mission command is a, is a kind of army concept. The other services sort sort of don't know what it is, but this idea of just tell everyone what you want to do, what you want to achieve, give them the resources to do it. And then trust them to get on with it, make decisions. Um, Current chief of the general staff, Mark Carlton Smith, um, I was in the room when he said, "Delegate until it hurts, and then delegate some more," which I think is a great, a great way. Now, if you can actually, if you actually believe that and do it and see it through, brilliant. But as one of his staff at the time, it's like fantastic. Off I go. Um, you know, don't be a dick. Just you know what we're trying to do here. Don't be a dick about it. Just just get on and do it, and I'll trust you and all that kind of stuff. So mission command, great. Doesn't seem to work on the comms side of it. There are so many good stories the military could could come out with. And I don't mean propaganda. I don't mean putting out you know an undiluted, you know, smorgasbord of fantastic news of, of people doing doing great things. But it is so possible to get your message out there and and to um, and to, to to have this conversation with the public that ultimately the military are there to serve and that pay the bills through social media by by trusting the men and women under them. Every now and again, somebody will drop the ball. That's fine. That's, that's going to happen. But why they don't allow people to do this? I, I know of a few who have kind of gone up gone up to the edge and have, have sort of had the collar felt a little bit and sort of reined back in. It's like, why are you doing this? There are so many good ambassadors there for for the military. You could you just trust them. The amount of haut, uh, bandwidth it's taking up in MOD, kind of controlling this, or I ask a question at 8 o'clock in the morning. I've got a 4 o'clock deadline that afternoon. It's a really easy question, and the, the quote I want eventually comes back at 9 o'clock that night when we've been online for an hour, and the, it's already gone to print. And it's a really bland statement because it's had to go through so many layers, being going up, going up another level, being signed off signed off by uh, you know OF5, then one star, and then someone else has got to have a look at it. And always oh, vaguely political, so we need to get make sure number 10 are happy with this. And It's like, God, you, you are missing the trick. I've given you an open goal here to... to to put your side of the story, open goal, albeit I've told you I've got a deadline, and and a lot of times you, you just get not nothing back or some really bland statement. So I don't know why the the military, but the army in particular, don't don't embody this mission command and trust their people to tweet and to comment and to uh, you know engage on social media. Most people I think know know when they are. They wouldn't know in policy terms. I mean, I don't know in policy terms, but they know when they're being a bit of a bit of a dickhead. So, so just just allow people to go to that point and no further. But um, do you think yeah. that'll change as? Do you think that'll change as the generation below us, behind us, gets into those senior positions? No, I think it'll get. I think it'll get worse before it gets better because um, the younger generation who are, I mean, my kids, are all over this, and and just not not just the 
the understanding of the of the landscape, but just the knobology, the just simple moving things about, you know, saving a knobology. Yeah. So so the is that an actual word. It is now. <laughs> but but the the buttonology, if you like. Um, so how do I if I if I if I do something how do I have got to save that to to my docs and then I've got to attach it to an email and then I've got to upload it and oh no it's over twenty five megs so I've got to drop box and all this kind of stuff they're just going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. they're like bloody Tom Cruise on Minority Report you know moving things moving things about and I think I think until that's just normal um, the the high, uh, senior echelons of the of the military and government will be scared by that and will try and cont contain it even more before. Before it's just so it's so natural and normal, and uh, I mean, you know, there's there's not an under, there's not a great understanding of of tech out there or what it can do for you. How, how long ago was it that were people wearing Strava watches and, and we're all tracking the CIA, you know, drone sites in North Africa? Um, yeah, people just don't know what what's still going on. on. Still goes on. Yeah, they don't know what the ones and zeros are doing, and they don't trust the people. So no, I'm I'm taken really interested in, in things like this, and uh, you know, if I'm allowed to. Ask a question. I'd be very interested to know why you started. Why you started this? I mean, it's a huge effort here. Um, why did I start it? Yeah. Um, because when I, for two reasons. So when I left, uh, when I left, I just it, like literally the day after I left. In fact, I I started work three days before I officially left the military. Like a lot of us do, we start ahead of the game, right? Um, and immediately upon starting my first job there was information that i learned straight away i thought i could have been told this six days ago i mean it started off with something as as little as i turned i was working in iraq private security and i turned and I, I got a job through a mate as we all do and i got there with my kit half the kit i didn't need so I got given a kit list, but half it just wasn't needed. It wasn't needed. Well, I could have been told this six days ago instead of lugging all this out. Why wasn't I told, for example? And then along the way, I learned stuff about, you know, how Civvy Street works. It's general how Civvy Street works. I was super naive. I was super, na not naive. Oh, no, not naive. That's the wrong word. I didn't understand Civvy Street. I didn't start understanding the commercial world, how, how no companies work and employ people until maybe four years ago. I'm, you know, I'm 40 now. I'm 36 years old. Forty. Oh, forty. You oh, did be a dick. <laughs> forty. Just turned forty. I've just turned forty. Right? I know. Yeah. Um, uh, that was one. And then I had a, you know, I, I've had a, I've had my ups and downs, and had some really serious downs for a long time, and, and also ex experienced other people, experiencing about other people having serious downs, you know. I had a, a mate of mine in 2016 kill himself. And there's been others since. But that one sticks in my mind because it's the first, it was out of the blue. It was out of the blue. It's also right at the start of where my, my sort of life started unraveling pretty pretty rapidly. My mental health started unraveling pretty rapidly. And I, I, do you know what? The reason I'm able to talk through it like this, actually I'm, not, I'm not normally that coherent with this because I'm, I'm delivering a talk to two para on Thursday about my experience with mental health, right? So I've, I've thought a lot about this over the last week. And his death, and he he was serving, he left, but he, he used to be military, and his death, it just was completely out of the blue. None of us expected it. His close, fr I said, his close friends he was serving, we'd all sort of lost touch, but it was completely out of the blue, and he's the person you would last think to top himself. Couldn't believe it, mate. Couldn't believe it. And... Uh, I also couldn't understand how someone can get the point in their life where th the only option they see in their head is to kill themselves and then to go through with it. You you think about the level of pain you have to. Oh God, mm. get it every time. <clears throat> you think the level of pain you have to be in to think about to do that. This just be, must be extraordinary, extraordinary, in the most negative sense of the word. And then, so fast forward in 2016 to about 2018, and I was <coughs> in that position it, where suicide crossed my mind. And um, and I thought, Jesus Christ, I've experienced him top himself. I'm fully aware of it, and yet I've now got to this position. You know, I, I, this is after the fact I'm thinking about this. And then I've got to this position. 
and I, I like to think I'm pretty switched on when it comes to my emotion, or I did at the time, my emotional awareness, where I'm, everyone thinks they're super switched on, especially ex-military. And I thought, man, I've experienced all this and still I've ended up in this position. Why? And other people were in that position as well. So how do you, communi- how do you communicate what went wrong in terms of me not me allowing myself to get that position? Where was the knowledge gap? Where could it have been changed? What was the situation that allowed me to get to that stage? You know, and it is a knowledge gap. But it, uh, how do you, if you go back to oh six oh seven when it kind of started, that my sort of j- journey downwards, if you like. I wasn't in the position where I would have been receptive to a mental health talk, for example, seriously receptive to it or understanding it because that's the way it was then. And even now you can't go in, it's difficult to go in and preach, preach this stuff, the importance of mental health awareness, for example, Hmm. to people of our background, because by its very definition, the military is a place where you don't, it's not okay to expose weakness. When you think about the enemy in context, or when you think about your chance of promotion, it's this place where you've got, it's, very, well, it's the military, it's flipping s- nails, strong people, you know, very masculine, very um, aggressive in nature. You know, the last thing you're going to do, want to do is expose a, perce- a perceived weakness. Yeah. So how would you contribute, how, how was I going to get, Communicate my lessons to the people, communicate my learnings to the people who need to hear it. And at the same time, I've gone right back. I was also, I'd also started listening to another podcast, Joe Rogan podcast, most successful one in the world. And through listening to that, I was just learning lots and lots of stuff about lots of different kinds of things. Hmm. So I um, started the podcast, yeah, with the intent of doing exactly what we're doing today. Having a conversation and along the way, people will pick up snippets of information, which they may or may not find useful. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, when you, it's better to have the knowledge and not need it, and not have the knowledge and need it, you know. And that's exactly what it is now. Along the conversations they have on the podcast, mental health, not all the time, but it does occasionally come up. And you, and then, as I have, I've learned so much. Like unbelie- I've learned an unbelievable amount. You're number 153, podcast number 153. The amount of knowledge I've got just helps me along the way, in all sorts of different things, including yeah. mental health on it so when i if i have an issue if I have someone else has, has an issue i have the knowledge to be able to go try this consider this or just to perceive things in a certain way you're in a different way you understand things better yeah. you know that's that's why i started it <laughs> <laughs> that's the longest answer i've ever given to that question but no, yeah. it, it, i mean but it does it does make sense it's like a um, it's like a stretcher race you've done a couple of those in your time i'm sure um you can't be on the stretch the whole time. Okay. It's also completely selfish. Completely selfish. This is my favourite day of the week. We enjoy having banter with like-minded people with a similar background, and most people enjoy that. But it's it's all the more it's all the more enjoyable. It holds so, so much more quality when you're from a, a background that is not, which is quite rare. Generally speaking, the general population, military background, and then you throw into that the times where we served, very kinetic times, the gold inverted commas, the golden times, this century of operations, you know, and it's, uh, you have an understanding of each other. Hmm. You, and it's nice to be able to talk like that. I get something, I get something from this conversation, believe it or not, Dom, I get yeah. something from this conversation, so it's enjoyable, you know, and also, there's, there's a lot of civilians listen to this. So I like to think they get an insight into things. And also, you, you mentioned earlier about the, um, I'm waffling away here. You, but you, you, listen, you, you pulled the pen. You mentioned earlier about the pity narrative. Oh my God. It's so damaging. And it's so wrong. It's so damaging. It's so wrong. We are like anyone else. We just, we're like anyone else. Perfections, imperfections. Well, no perfections, but <laughs> good things and imperfections, right? Lots of different capabilities, lots of different experience. And yet, there has been this thing over the last few years of the pity narrative that come around. And the other, and, and bolted onto that is sometimes an air of entitlement. Like we're entitled to X, Y, or Z. Yeah. We, I'm entitled to get the best job ever. Or I'm entitled to command this respect because this is my background. Or people saying that we're entitled to it and they didn't even serve themselves. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. You earn, you earn that. You demonstrate it through, what's the, you know, you, you, 
you earn respect based on merit. People give you respect based on merit. What you like, what you're capable of. It's exactly the same with this. There's no entitlement whatsoever. There's, and there shouldn't be any pity narrative. Yeah, I mean, I, I, try, and, I try and counter that through my journalism. I mean, I, I'm not a one-trick pony constantly banging the, the veterans drum that you know, would very rapidly turn people off, not least which veterans. But, but I do, every now and again, just, just, I'm just keen to put it out there that, that it's, not, it's not all like that. Um, you know, like stories like Poseidon. It's a great, great story. That you know, but behind it, there's some, uh, there's some very strong guys, um, stronger for, for acknowledging that every now and again you, you know, you stumble, and um, but that's that's normal, right? It is so, normal. It so is we, normal. we do this thing where we we do this thing where we, it, we we completely ignore the mental health. Okay, and I'm saying we. I'm not just talking about the military. I want about every. I'm on about people in general. We completely ignore the mental health. We do. We don't pay it complete lip service. We don't, don't pay any attention to it for whatever reason, right? But the reality is that what we are capable of doing in life as people, as human beings, what we're capable of doing and achieving, is all down to our the quality of our health. And health is two parts: physical health and mental health. Look at how we treat physical health. We treat it in three ways. We do it. In th we treat it in three ways: preparation, maintenance, and reparation. We prepare our bodies be because we want to lift 140 kilograms next w next year in the gym. So we go and we bench press today. We work towards it. We want to run a sub eight minute or sub seven minute, seven and a half minute, one point five, uh, one and a half miles, whatever. We prepare our bodies for to undertake arduous events. We do it in the military as well. Some people don't prepare to achieve anything, but they maintain them because of the value of maintaining your body because they don't want to be a couch potato and be fat and more subject to illness, for example. And then we repair our bodies when we come have a physical injury or physical illness. And we either do that ourselves through the knowledge we already have and we understand it. We go, okay, I need to rest tomorrow or for the next week because I've really pulled my hamstring. Or we identify something in your body, an injury, an illness, a joint pain, and we go to the doctor and go, hmm, I got a drama. Not quite sure what it is. Help me out. Mental health should be treated in exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. There's no ifs, no buts. You should look at it the same way. Preparation, maintenance, and reparation. We don't do it though. We don't even pay attention to what's going on. Most people, I, I, I think of a huge proportion of people go through their lives where they're just an underlying feeling, for a long time, underlying feeling of just, there's a general unhappiness, discontentment, for whatever reason. They don't do anything about it. Fucking miserable. It's going through life. That's where I was in 06, 07. And for some people, that carries on down. And it, it carried on down for me and you just spiral off a cliff. Mm -hmm. Some people, it doesn't. But why be in that position? Why allow it? Yeah. Why, yeah. why do we put up with it? Go and get it fixed. I suppose it's because we think it's, I don't know, think it's normal or... Actually, no, that's not right. No, you don't, you don't think it's normal because that's why, you know, some people... Well, hopefully you do, you do your own are able to uh, to reach out. So I had a little wobble a couple of years ago, and um, I've got a for all, for all my get beef. Let's get on the mic here. Sorry. For all my beef about uh, about the mainstream media, <laughs> Telegraph have been very good employees to me. So we have a uh, we have a, um, a GP, in-house GP. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Just next to the in-house masseur. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. It's brilliant. Um, <laughs> anyway. No, I went to, I was just feeling a bit kind of, uh, you know, I went and saw the GP. And um, not knowing the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, I just sort of felt something was out, out of sorts. And um, so I said to my GP, I said, I don't, I don't, I could do, I don't think I need to talk to someone. Don't know what about. But um, I said, I, which, is it a psychiatrist or a psychologist? If you if you want to set up a GPMG in the newsroom and kill everyone in the building, or if you want to set up a GPMG in the newsroom and kill everyone in the building, but you just haven't got the time in your busy day, and she said, right, the first one is a psychologist, and the second one is an occupational psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, what is it the other way? Um, I th I think I think we need to have a chat. <laughs> and so I went and had a few had a few sessions with a, a very nice doctor. And it's it's so it's so strange. It's almost that act, just the act of going, of, of physically going somewhere. Because if you said to me now, well, what did you talk about? So I, I don't know. Talked about me and um, the weather. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know, but 
a few, a few of those. And, um, you know, I was chatting to, to muckers of mine still serving, um, you know, on WhatsApp, just sort of chin wagging. And, and there's no, there's no, there's no ju judgment. Everyone, everyone was just kind of, well, let's, you know, meet up or we'll go for a run or we'll go for whatever. I mean, I've never felt any, any downside to it on any, on any, any side of it. And then like I say, I can't, can't put my finger on now and say what, what happened, but you know, didn't set up the GPG. I wouldn't know. I'd catch my thumb in or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, just just talking, just just seemed to. It was, and I think that was the that was in your your analogy there. That was the that was the repair bit. It just needed just needed a bit of kind of pff, bit of downtime. Just do nothing. What should you say? Do nothing. When was the last time you did nothing? And you get awareness from it, right? So you, you you're more aware of yourself from it, which is you just monitor yourself better, like we do in the physical health. Um, uh, Part part of the, I think part of the barrier to uh, apart from the obvious ones in the military or the obvious ones with people with men in particular uh, to go in and get help is that we talked about the weakness thing. But the other one is how do you go and ask for help for something you, which is in, you, it's indescribable? You can't describe it. That was one of the issues I had I went, when I when I finally went after getting badgered by. A mate for a long time to go and get help, and then uh, until it was almost too late, I, I went. I didn't know what I was asking for. I didn't know. I didn't know it was help the help the heroes place in um, Colchester. I didn't know what I was asking for. I walked in, and then the, the lady said, "Hi, um, how can I help?" And I said, "I need to speak to someone." And I, I was in a, a state. I need to speak to someone, please. She said, "What about?" And I burst into tears. One, because I, I was embarrassed and ashamed. I was, I was going in and asking for help, mm -hmm. one. Um, and two, because I didn't know. What am I asking help for? And then I got put into a room with a um, couple of ladies who worked there. Asked the same question again. Couldn't answer. Couldn't answer. Couldn't answer it. And going back to your point, even now, if you ask me, well, what was the problem then? I can tell you on a high level, well, I was all over the shop because of X, Y, and Z. But I couldn't, I can't, it's hard to describe what exactly it was at the time you can't you can't it's indescribable yeah. so how do you ask for help about that because what are you asking for help for why and, and it's why are you asking for help you don't need help you know it's i think it's because you're a solutioneer i think most people in the military are solutioneers you kind of see that see this see the the end state you know where we're trying to get to and all oh, my, my problem is how to get from here to there my problem is not working out what the end state is i'm told what that is so i think when it comes to yourself you then when someone says oh, what's, what's the problem you go well i don't know <laughs> so so that that not knowing what the what the problem is means that you you don't take any action to address it. Sometimes the, the action is just to go and say, I've I, I no idea. I just need to just need to talk to someone. Like I said, I, I can't. I can barely remember some of these conversations. But um, she was either a genius and, I, and asked me everything that without me even knowing it, or or just the simple act of of acknowledging that you haven't got all the answers and you don't you don't have to know what the problem is. Before you are, before you just go, could do, could do just a bit of a time out here. I think the the the, the best ones, therapists or psychologists, psychiatrists, they, or most of them, is they get you, they allow you to self-analyze. You talk in a way, you know, and you, but at the same time, you self-analyze and assess, and you become more more aware of yourself. And 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 as that goes on, certainly for myself, it's at the forefront. Of my, it's a, it literally is the forefront of my mind, not forefront of my mind. My awareness of my mental health is as prominent in my mind as my awareness of my physical health. It just is now. It, because that's how I've, because of the knowledge I've got, the experiences I've gone through, and I, I understand how important it is. And I'm really also, do you know what's really interesting? Really, I'm really fortunate as well. I've got a, there's a group of, got just all different circles of friends, got a circle of friends, and we range from, there's a lad, he listens to this actually, Ash Fletcher. And he's only 26, right? I think 26, young. He served. Um, he's out now. And then, at the t so that's on the sort of the younger end of the scale, this circle of friends. Then at, at the uh, upper end, <laughs> I say the upper end, myself, and a couple of others that are around about the same age. We've got, uh, and we've got CEO, there's a CEO in the group, you know, these are professional people in there. Some civvies, some not, okay? And we, the subject of mental health, right? This, 
there's no question about it. It's like normal conversation. And it's hard. It's, when you try and describe, well, how does that look like? Oh, yeah, let's talk about mental health for that. No, it doesn't work like that. This is, this is an example of it. So another one, Paul Godonis, another friend, right? An example. Paul will say, how are you doing, mate? When I respond to him, I'm, I will, I'm honest. You know, in the same way, you, if he was to ask, what's your physical, how's your physical health at the minute? And I'd say, oh, mate, my knees give me a bit of jip, but apart from that, I'm on the ball. Back. When he says, how are you doing, mate? I answer, honestly, because it's, it's like, it's just natural. Yeah, generally, right? Bit of a rough week last week, but, you know, a bit stressed at the moment. But a little bit, a bit answer, honestly, whereas the default for most people isn't. Mm. It isn't, because I think another thing with that is you, you, people always want to paint a rosy picture of where they are in their life. Don't they? I think, especially blokes, especially, at, well, ex-military, especially ex-military have left as well. Because everyone, well, no, I think, and certainly for myself, I think at the time, you want to, you, you, you want to be successful. You want to show that you've made, a, especially people who decided to leave and not come to the end of their time. You want to show that I made the right decision. I'm so successful. I'm so much better off than I was before. Hmm. Which is why quite often when you're serving, you will get a misrepresentation of what Civvy Street is like or a job is like from someone you ask is on the outside. They're not going to tell you, or very rarely they're going to tell you it's rubbish, mate, don't do it, I should never have made this decision. They're not going to tell you that. Mm. Yes, mega. Mm. I think. No, I think you're right. I think you know, everyone wants to make the right decision. There might not necessarily be a success. That might be for other other factors, but you know, I, I made the right decision. That's, that's natural. I think that's, that's, only, that's only natural. Yeah. That's all I've got to say about that. Where did all that come from? How do you start the podcast? That one, it? We'll hear what my next question is. Yeah. No, we have got time. We've got time for one more, mate. So it's, uh, we're an hour and six minutes in. We've got a little bit longer. A little bit longer, if you want. You can have it. Well, I mean, I, so I, I'm interested in messaging and comms and all the rest of it. Hence, hence move into journalism. People say, oh, that's, that's a, bit of a bit of a change. I don't think it has been really you know the animal the journalist as an animal is very similar to the military person inquisitive self-starting you know want to stand up to bullies ask the question why not take not take glib answers idealistic um, journalist head, headstrong yeah <laughs> um so i yeah i like i like being this side of the fence although it's not what I, it's difficult is um but i'm just I, i'm just interested in in your perception, and I, I say, you know, you've you've done a lot of work with this that that I just don't don't see through any other channels. Um, reaching out to a different audience, getting in depth. You say we're going, going for an hour and six. It feels like barely two hours. Um, <laughs> Cheers, mate. You know, I just, I'm interested in how you're how you're reaching people and they're engaging with you. Print print media, online media is, is very can be quite clunky we try we try desperately the kind of holy grail is how to get your how to get your readership involved how to get people how to start the debate how to get people you know feeding back to you show show that in, that engagement so hence you know, you can register for the paper you subscribe to the paper, all this kind of stuff but i think i think there's um i think what you're doing here and through this medium and having these these long form conversations um is the way that the communication landscape should go and I, I'm surprised there aren't more as I say I come back I don't know why there's, there's why, where's the MD podcast I, I don't know why they don't have that have the confidence to do that you know what have we talked about today there's nothing today that if either of us were still serving anyone would have any OPSEC or PERSEC issues about at all operational security or personal security issues about at all I I would venture um and yet and yet these things don't exist so uh, yeah, the, 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 the military is getting smaller. Want to attract from a from a population that has increasing choices about where they should put their their time and effort. Um, I'm just I'm staggered at the, at the comms landscape, formally from from government. People are too worried about putting their foot in it. They're too worried about putting their foot in it, right? And then they care too much about what happens if they do put their foot in it. Like people, right? Two things. People make mistakes. That's one. The second thing is, people don't have to change their minds. That's, that's, that's the second one, right? And we're not talking about religious specific here. Certainly with politics and stuff like that is concerned. Um, and so they're afraid to put their foot in it and afraid, afraid of the repercussions. But what if an example of the military, you know, the, the, a military kind of podcast or anything with the news, right? So let me 
tell you, uh, like, like, sorry, anything from an organization, like a news organization or, or a company, when I look at it, the first thing I think, and if I saw a military podcast, for example, the first thing I think is, is it going to be decent listening? Is it going to be, is it going to be decent listening? listening? Probably not. And this is, I'm just me saying this, and I haven't given this any depth of thought, right? Probably not, because they're going to be, they're going to have to toe a line. They're going to have to toe a line, and the individuals on that podcast, if there's more than one, because if the individuals on that podcast, they are going to, they are going to feel constrained in what or be actually constrained in what opinions they can or can't express. And then what that means is, the conversation, and it's obvious when that's happening, you can hear it. That means that, means that you are not listening to an honest conversation. You're not listening to Hugh and Dom discussing things, going round the houses, we covered in multiple different topics here. The, it is not good listening, you know it's not honest, and so what are you getting from it? What are you getting, you're getting nothing from it. Mm. You wanna listen, you wanna eavesdrop. It wants to feel like you are eavesdropping on two people having an honest conversation, you're getting, and, and you know, you know they're talking the truth because they don't think they're being listened to, for example, or they don't care. You know, I'd be honest, I, you know, I've dropped some clangers on this podcast over the years. I think, oh my God, you know, some of that stuff, if it's taken the wrong way, or even what guests have said, you take out a sound bite and then I'm guilty by association, mm. you know, um, but you, you, you can't, if you want something to be decent quality and you want people to listen to it and take something away from it and, and give it an ounce of respect, then you, I think you have to have, you have to, you have to commit to it in a way and just think let's let's do this let's set some let's set some broad guidelines then anything that falls within those guidelines let it happen let it happen let the ships fall where they, where they may if we mess up we can just correct it and we learn along the way but the organizations corporations military establishments aren't going to do that they're too concerned about what people are going to think and what the newspapers are going to say or social media is going to say yeah. yeah, which which I, I get, and you know you've got to pay attention to your to your reputation, and and that's formed by um, well a whole, whole number of things. I remember George Bush when he was in when he was president, George W. Bush, he complained, or the White House complained to Al Jazeera about the amount of airtime they'd given footage they'd given to Osama bin Laden, and. Uh, and Al Jazeera turned around and said, right, well, here are the stats. Over the last two years, you, your face, your words, your voice, you have been, uh, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but you know, you've been on more than Osama bin Laden. So in terms of getting your message out, you've had m more than your fair share. Now, what you do with that time is up to you. How you build your reputation, the things you say, the way you act, the things you do, having said you're going to do that, did you actually do it? You know, all that adds to your reputation. But, you know, you can't say that we've we've not been fair to you. So, back, you know, clunky analogy. But what I'm saying is that, yes, your reputation matters, but, but you, you are your reputation. You live it. And sometimes you get it wrong, sometimes you get it right. You, you own the problems, you move on, or you try and bluff it out and all this kind of stuff. So I don't, again, it comes back to I don't know why they're scared. I don't know why they don't offer more. And when they get it wrong, they say we got it wrong. Big deal. And you, you, you build a brand. I thought there was a great thing. Oh, what was it? Uh, COP26 last last month um, CNN anchor forgive me it might not be CNN it was an, an American American news broadcaster um, first day he said hello welcome to Edinburgh for uh, you know COP26 blah 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 and the tagline at the bottom of the screen said coming live from Edinburgh comma Scotland and um, and spec savers tweeted that out tweeted that screenshot of this guy and, and with the banner saying welcome to Edinburgh Scotland Specsavers tweeted that out, just with just the words, should have gone to Glasgow. Now, I thought it was hilarious, right? Because we, we can all hear, I mean, that, that bone line should have gone to Specsavers has been around for years. Well, I thought, that's rubbish. I mean, what's it, should have gone to Specsavers? But this line now, they say, should have gone to Glasgow. And we're all immediately here, hey, should have gone to Specsavers. So their marketing is brilliant. They're getting their brand in there. So not only do we all hear the tagline, should have gone to Specsavers, but also, they're showing a bit of personality. It's a bit funny. Okay, it's, it's gently prodding, a, you know, humour at you know, the American News Channel. But but hey, they'll get over it. And I thought that is that is clever comms. That is very clever comms. Um, uh, the forgive me, I'm on a roll. The press <laughs> spokesman in the U.S. Embassy, Aaron Aaron, God, I can't remember his surname. Lovely lovely chap. I should remember. He took me for lunch. 
Um, or did I take him flash? Come on. Anyway, no, lo lovely guy. He 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 did a, a series of tweets um, when he took over when he when he arrived in in the UK. Just this this ten second clip on on Twitter. You see a microwave going around. Ping. He turns up, opens the door, gets a cup of tea out, <laughs> sips it, and goes, "Mmm, perfect," and moves off camera. Meltdown. Absolute <laughs> meltdown. You know, Brits go, "That's outrageous," but. You know, great banter with our US cousins, and it's just that's good messaging. It's not, hey, look at the great things we're doing with our overseas aid, and oh, look, I just thought that's that's very clever. There's there's some ways of using social media. You're going to get it wrong, you're going to get it right, but just there's some very very clever ways of doing it. And the default setting of if you say nothing, you won't be wrong might be true, but it's very behind the times now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And going to yeah, go back to your point that put that. When you exhibit, especially on the humor side, you you can people connect with it. You're, the, you're real then. It's like, you know, it's like one of the reasons Trump would have got, got into a begin the president. One of the big reasons there is, I think, because he's got a personality. He's not a politician. He's got a personality. Same as Boris Johnson. I'm not comparing Trump and Boris Johnson. But Boris Johnson, he's got a personality. He looks like one of us in that he's scruffy occasionally, well, all the time. He bumbles words, he, he's like a bumbling fool sometimes. And, you know, I think a lot of that's calculated as well. You can connect with him. There's something there. It's like personality. It's the same, you know, it's, again, it goes back to the, this, this kind of thing. If you're going to, like you said, if you're going to, you know, it needs to be, it can be clever comms or it can just be honest comms. We need to put your balls in on the balls in line somewhere if you're going to do it. Otherwise, it's just, it's just a wasted effort. The other thing is, though, I think the advantage I have, one, I'm not beholden to anyone. They're a sponsor to the podcast, but they know that they don't they don't control who I have on or what. Like, there's no there's none of that. They, I'm very, very, very fortunate. And two, I'm not reliant on this as a business or to make me money. You know, I have a job. I have a day job. Don't get me wrong. The long game is I'd love to do. I'd love to do this. You know, as a as a retirement. You know, turning over enough money so I can retire, doing podcasting, enjoying it, and, and something that is valuable to other people. But I don't have to do that now. You know, so I, I don't have that pressure, which is not the case for other individuals. Mm. Not the case for podcasts that come from mainstream media outlets. Or come from organisations or corporations. I mean, to be honest, my my, my opinion is that the, the, the real definition of a podcast is something that is truly independent, truly independent. Now, arguably, that's not me because I've got sponsors, but really, mm -hmm. it's just me. You know, I I think I think because the, the the word podcast has been hijacked. It, like, if you look at BBC, for example. You can go on the BBC website and you'll scroll down. You see, oh, such and such a podcast. No, 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 it's not a podcast. Two years ago, that was just an interview. It's just a whatever you want to call it. And now you just you changed the word to podcast. It's not a podcast. You just call it that because it's a buzzword. It happens a, a, a lot of places. In fact, we discussed this before, didn't we? You know, do we? What, yeah. why Last year when we were first remember? talking. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Anyway, I'll stop waffling. Were you? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> why are you looking at that? <laughs> No, but you know, it's. Uh, I, I think. Back to your point. If you're going to do it, you need to take risks. Otherwise, it's it's just rubbish. It's just rubbish. It's propaganda. Like you know, yeah. like you said, it's just rubbish. You know, produce it for a reason to demonstrate value to the people who you want to receive it. You know, like actual value, and not. And other reasons can be to bring more attention to your organization, corporation, you as a person, whatever brand, make money, whatever. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm waffling on now. We're now 18 minutes in, 19 minutes in. What have we covered? What have we not covered that you want to cover? Um, apart from lunch. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, the, we have. We, in a roundabout, in, in the delightfully roundabout way, I'm, I'm just fascinated by, by communication and... and um, and how, how people uh, express themselves, and uh, and that, and that moment when when people don't don't communicate and express themselves, and they and they need to. So no, I'm. It's been delightful to be here. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me on. My pleasure, mate. My pleasure. Any time. 
at any time. Cheers. And good shelf. It is a nice shelf. <laughs> Dom. A bit wonky. Uh, oh, roll it, like that? I, in fact, I piss off. How do, uh, right, how do people follow you? How do people get older? You're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, at Dom Nichols. Um, and that's it. I don't do the book. I'm at the Telegraph, dominic.nichols at telegraph.co.uk. Um, happy to chat. I don't. I don't do leaks. Always, um, you know, at someone else's agenda. You don't do leaks. No, not interested. Someone ringing up saying, "Oh, I've got some scuttlebutt here for you." Now that might be a start. I'll look into it, and if I satisfy myself that it is true, and they did do that, and X, Y, and Z had happened, fine. I might run the story. But someone ring me up saying, "I've got a story for you." Yeah, this happened. Psh, 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 psh. Off you go. <laughs> that doesn't work like that, my friend. How often does that happen? Not with me. Well, not often now. Maybe because they've tried once and. Now there will be parliamentary correspondence. I'm not talking about the Telegraph. But I know I know other people will will take that kind of stuff, or there's loads of websites that will just print it. There are other news media organisations that run away with that kind of stuff. The the argument I've heard people say again, not 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 from the Telegraph. Uh, I've heard people say, "Oh, we're not we're not saying it's happened. We're just saying that someone said it happened." Like, nope, not interested in that game. Not interested in that game. I am um, I'm. Uh, I like the forces. I was in the forces for 23 years, I, uh, which means that that I have a level of understanding, but also a level a level that I won't I won't accept bullshit. And so um, I will hold feet to the fire if if I have you know if I have to. Um, so I'm not I'm not soft on on defence, but equally I won't I won't let it I won't just invite ridicule where it's not uh, where it's not deserved. So no, I don't I don't do leaks. I don't do any of that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, but willing to have a conversation with anyone if there's if there's something going wrong systemic that's going wrong or or, or people have been uh, mistreated either in career terms or physically or emotionally anything at all then you know, I'm very happy to help out where I can shine a light I do believe in that you know shine a light in dark places thing I know it's some it's a bit quaint and some people go oh yes so you know you just you know that's, that's so old school or or you know it doesn't work like that anymore so yeah i think it does i think it does well it's not a bad handle move away from that um you know it's a bit like the old deal. name name rank number big six now isn't name, name rank number day birth religion draw a line around that stay stay inside the box you'll occasionally i've done these courses you'll occasionally come outside the box because you're tired and you're cold and you're like, oh no and the answer is don't beat yourself up about it just get back in the box as quick as you can so my analogy is Shine light in dark places. That's kind of inside the box. I'll move away from it occasionally, but you know, it's it's not a bad handrail to hang on to. Um, yeah, keep keep trying to do what I'm what I do. I don't. I'm not. I'm not the best. Certainly not the best journalist out there. <laughs> you do yourself a disservice. No, I, I, without blowing smoke up your ass, it's important that people are out there. Like we, you know, my contempt at times for mainstream media is blatant because i say it like it breaks me regularly okay but i think this will be a comment we've talking about on the podcast before there are there are people like yourself like others out there who are writing and reporting and doing journalism and providing and providing a source of information that is reliable that is reliable you can look at it and go Maybe not agree with it or, or agree with it or not the opinion that's been expressed. But you could look and go, "That is, to your point, credible." I can I can take this information, and and be reassured that the intent behind it is is honest, and the sources are there's some due diligence gone into it. I think okay, you know, in general. And that's important because, especially for myself, definitely for myself, and I talk about others, talk with other people about this regularly. It's like, man, I just, I'm desperate for. It, it's not, it can't happen. But I, if there was a, if I could go to a single source of information to go and get my gen, to go and get the genuine stuff, maybe the opinions align with what I think or not. I don't. I just want something reliable to go. I can go here and this for information. You can't, that's not possible this day and age. It's just not. So, the way I have to well, the way I have to do it now is go to, go to pockets here and there, where I can what I can rely on, which is a pain in the ass, right? But I think more and more people are realising that now, to go the need for quality journalism, reliable news, 
is has been never more important than now. I don't think. I really don't think so. We we talked about earlier about polarization and societal discontent. I think you know, for that reason, that's one big reason. It's never been more important than it is now. Just to just to get people paying attention to and thinking more about what they think, why they think it, why their opinion is what it is, a little bit more in depth than what they're doing now, and what the media does, what the news does, is a big part of that. So, well done. Well done, Dom, for being on my Christmas list. Oh, thank you. No, pleasure to be here. <laughs> that, that, was a comp- that long thing was a compliment <laughs> in there somewhere. Mate, it's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Right, cool. Cheers, you. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear, if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.